I started a new project, an 8-bit Mini ITX PC. Stay tuned to know why, how and why I call it the 8-bit dream. As a collector of retro computers, I sometimes get the question about what computer to buy for children to learn to program, just like I did when I was a kid with the VIC-20. There are many reasons to buy a retro computer, but that is not one of them. Old computers aren't very reliable. Just by being old, some components like electrolytic capacitors and batteries will start leaking highly corrosive liquids that will destroy their circuit board as well as the surrounding components, like on this poor Mac 2 Si. Chips in plastic packages may also attract moisture in humid environments, which will lead to unexplainable failures. While capacitors and some logic chips are available from reputable online dealers, most spare parts must be tracked down on eBay or taken from a donor machine with a price tag to match. Even a fully working machine may not offer the experience you expect. Computer graphics with 320 by 200 pixels in 16 colors may have been amazing in 1982, but on a modern large TV it appears quite tiny or very blocky. The keyboard on, say, Commodore 64 was decent for its day, but in modern times, with its quirky layout, spongy keys and tall case, we would consider it an ergonomic disaster. Don't get me started on data storage on cassettes and floppies. As far back as 2006, I started a set of projects where I wanted to build a series of computers reflecting the development of the PC as I saw it, from a simple 8-bit machine with only a serial port to a 6830 based Unix workstation. I only built three boards of the first model. The idea was a computer with minimal stuff between user and system, and as simple as possible so that anyone can wrap their heads around it. The 8-bit guy has the same idea. So what I want is a computer like I grew up on. I want something that's simple enough that a single person can understand all of its components. In his clip, the 8-bit guy describes something that is both like a C64 and at the same time not a C64. It shouldn't be compatible with the C64, but it would also be nice if it had a connector for a Commodore floppy drive. He don't want an FPGA, because of cost, and that people would be able to change the system. Now, I don't agree with all this, so I decided to make my own version of the 8-bit guy's dream computer. An affordable 8-bit modern computer, offering good experience for both programming and games. First thing on my list is the Mini ITX form factor. It will fit in any ATX or Mini ITX case. This one looks nice. and the board fits perfectly inside. The ATX power connector allows any ATX power supply to be connected. The ATX standard includes a soft power on signal and a power good signal that are asserted and monitored by the power manager, a PIC 16F18875 programmed for the purpose. The power manager also monitors the power and reset button and is connected to the main system over the SPI bus. 
There are also some diagnostic LEDs to show that all ATX power rails and signals are OK. While there are plenty of rails from the power supply, there are also six other on the board. The main CPU is the 65C816, clocked at 14 MHz, and the memory is 512K SRAM. This is large enough to allow a 128K frame buffer or even larger, and decently large programs without resorting to assembler. A 38K by 8 spy flash gives plenty of room for a basic and a rudimentary operating system. To tie CPU, RAM and ROM together, as well as implement most peripherals, there is an FPGA, a Max 10 from Intel Altera. It is in an unfriendly BGA256 package, but that is unfortunately necessary to get enough I.O. Video out is DVI over a small cheap connector for that video standard that requires a fat license fee and should be compatible with TVs and monitors with that connector. Nudge nudge, wink wink. Not a wink, nudge nudge, nudge nudge. <laughs> Say no more. There is analog audio output via an 18 bit DAC. Mass storage is done on a standard SD card in spy mode and a PS2 keyboard is used for typing. What looks like an Ethernet jack is in fact an RS-232 port. The reason for the RJ45 jack is to make it different from the joystick ports and also that it is a lot cheaper. The RS-232 port is used to download data into the flash. A retro computer needs joysticks. The 8-bit Dream has two Atari-style joysticks and will support any compatible joystick, including Amiga analog joystick and Atari paddles. A second spy bus connects the flash and the real-time clock calendar to the system. It also connects the power manager, which doubles as a joystick controller as well. Today, no one makes a dedicated video chip suitable for an 8-bit computer, so the video controller for the 8-bit Dream has to be integrated into the FPGA. This will allow DVI video out and two video modes to start with. The first mode is an ordinary character cell 80x25 text mode with 16 colors from a 24-bit true color palette for both fore and background colors. The second mode is a bitmapped 320x200 pixel graphics mode intended for game graphics. It allows 256 colors from a true color palette and uses 64K of RAM. This is similar enough to the VGA mode 13 to allow porting of games. And Sadly, yes, 320 by 200 will look tiny or very blocky on a big modern TV. The bitmap mode will allow a blitter-ish hardware to offload the CPU. The exact blitter capabilities is limited by available gates and imagination. As with video, there is no one who makes an audio generator for 8-bit computers anymore. We could use a vintage chip like the SID. I don't mind the SID, but... It's vintage and very limited availability. It's very expensive at $50 to $100 on eBay. CD quality digital audio is a bit too much for the CPU to handle, so there is really only one option left. Roll our own. I have no intention of making a clone of the SID, but I'll be heavily inspired by it. Someone spent a lot of time thinking about frequency ranges, attack and sustain and stuff, and there's no reason to do that again. I will not make any attempt to make the 8-bit Dream audio generator directly compatible with the SID chip, but there will be similarities. This is a SID voice. It has a waveform generator for triangle, sawtooth, square wave and noise. To shape the waveform into something musical, there is an envelope generator. Basically, it generates a gain profile with four parts, attack, decay, sustain and release. The envelope is applied through a modulator. The shaped waveform is then passed into a filter section with selectable high band and low pass characteristics. There is also a section for sampled audio. To keep things simple and in the 8-bit spirit, samples are 8-bit and limited to 2, 4, 8 or 16 kHz sample rates. These rates are easily upsampled to whatever the rate we use for the DAC is. 
This section has the built-in DMA that fetches samples from RAM into the sample rate converter when gated. It has an envelope generator that is identical to that in the other voice. The envelope is applied the same way as for a generated voice and passed through an identical filter. Finally, all channels are mixed and sent to an output level adjustment stage before being sent to the DAC. Audio quality won't be stellar, but it won't suck either. So, how many channels are we talking about here? The SID had three voices, so that is a minimum. I'm thinking six voices that can be assigned either as a sample source or as an oscillator. It all depends on how many macrocells are left in the MAX10. This concludes part one of the 8-bit dream. So click the subscribe button below so you won't miss the second part. Also, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up and feel free to leave a comment below.